Georges Franju was one of the greatest French filmmakers. Uh, however, in his own lifetime, he wasn't really appreciated enough. Uh, this, I think, is because he didn't really fit into any of the categories. He was a very much a, of an individualist. He started as a documentarist, and one of his first films was Le Sang des Bêtes, uh, The Blood of Animals, and it was a documentary about an abattoir. And rather than making a conventional film about the workings of an abattoir, he took almost like a delicious pleasure in the actual slaughtering. People said at the, f when they saw this film that there was a great talent here, but also a sort of dark talent. After several other important documentaries, uh, he started making fiction films. Uh, Eyes Without a Face was his second. He went on to make Thomas Lamposteur and a lovely film called Judex. But he remained hard to classify in the canon of French cinema. Eyes Without a Face is about a mad doctor who uh, is an expert in skin grafting. He crashed a car uh, and the accident led to his daughter's face being permanently scarred. Now he is so racked with guilt about that that he wants to try and find a way of restoring the beauty of her face. In the film he has a sidekick played by Alida Valley and we hear as the story progresses that he previously operated on her successfully to give her a beautiful face. So the thrust of the film is how they together as a team can find young women whose faces he can remove so that once again his daughter can go back into the world. What's interesting about this film is that it isn't exactly a horror movie. Franju, in fact, called it um, an anxiety movie. He wanted to disturb people not at a rational level but at an irrational level. The daughter walks around in her Givenchy clothes with this kind of Mona Lisa mask on her face. The film in some way reminds me more of a painting by someone like Salvador Dali than other types of films. I think what he tries to do in the film uh, is almost slow your heartbeat. It has a trance-like rhythm, which I think is very unusual. Most horror movies try to quicken your heartbeat so you're so excited. But what Franju understood is that if you're excited, you can't feel other emotions. So what he does on purpose is create a very kind of neutral, almost documentary-like baseline, and then interspace it with shocks and poetic moments, which means that people can have a much broader uh, response to the film. One of the best examples of uh, Franju trying to lull people before he tries to unsettle them is in the famous sequence where um, Pierre Brasseur is going to visit his daughter who lives in the top of the house. Now instead of seeing him uh, get out of his car, walk in the door, walk up steps and arrive at the daughter's bedroom, we have a very long, almost soundless sequence where he goes through a door and another door and another door, and then up some steps and then up some more steps and then we see them from a low angle and then a high angle. You could say that this is an incredibly uneconomical way of making a film, you know. Any decent fiction director would just cut to the girl upstairs, but it's to establish an unusual rhythm, a kind of trance-like pace, which means that we know that we are in unusual territory. This film is unflinching. It doesn't blink. What is the, the big surprise for people who first see the film is that you don't cut away from the scene where the face, is, the skin has been taken off. Franju is clearly very interested in looking at the horror straight in the eye. He had this great phrase that he hated what he called perfume photography. He hated soft focus, uh, la di da type imagery. He hated. Uh, nice pictures, you know, and I think that's why he hired this great cinematographer, Eugen Schuften, who helped shoot Metropolis. The combination of Franju and the great cinematographer guaranteed a very sort of concrete type of horror. Demain, il sera trop tard, mon petit. Watching this film today, it does bring very uncomfortable associations with the the, the Fred West uh, case, for example, and uh, other examples, Mara Hindley. When Alida Valley goes out to a cinema queue and she cruises the line and finally picks her girl and sidles up to her and offers her a ticket for the cinema. Now there's undoubtedly a sexual element to this, and yet we know what it's for. She's there to get the girl to have her killed to be skinned alive, what a terrible idea.
this film doesn't allow you simply to be repelled by the horror. It doesn't allow any simple response at all. And therefore, um, as you're hoping that the girls uh, won't get ensnared by this black widow, at the same time, you have sympathy for Alita Valley's character. Because she is an eyes actress, you know, that her blackness of her eyes and the so many times she cries in the film, uh, it means that you have great compassion for her also. And half of you wants her to succeed, to be happy. She in the film is uh, the Grim Reaper, the figure of death, the body snatcher, if you like. But what's unusual is that she goes out in a little 2CV, the most benign and innocent of images, and the music isn't the horror movie music, it isn't Hitchcock's Bernard Herrmann type um, violins or anything. It's carnival music, the music we associate with fun and pleasure. feels that there's a certain hatred of women in the film. I think it's hard to deny that. But also, in a strange way, a hatred of cinema. The face has been fetishized almost in cinema, and this seems to be a film that it almost is expressing an anger with the idea that faces are so important in the movies. If you look at how the critics uh, reacted to this film, it's amazing how strongly they felt. The utter scorn and vilification and hatred it's similar to the way they reacted to Michael Powell's Peeping Tom. It's similar in the way that they reacted to Hitchcock's Psycho. They used words like revulsion, sick, this is for perverted people, this is for sick-minded people. Uh, they recoiled in horror. One critic said, in all my years, I've never seen a more sick film. Uh, you really get the impression that they didn't see past the few very startling, uh, horrific images in the film. Because the film is ambivalent, because it is, insists on beauty as well as terror, uh, it means that when we look at it now, years later, we can see that it is a, a much richer film than it people first thought. You can see this idea that he loved humanity and hated humanity at the same time. That complex view is here in Eyes Without a Face and that's why the film remains important. <laughs>